Okay, so we finished with all of the major blood vessels. What's the nickname I told you to remember for the arteries? They're what reservoirs? Pressure reservoirs. They store the pressure. That's why we measure 120 over 80 for the blood pressure being the average, is because we're looking at the pressure. We watch that change. Does it change a lot? Does it go from 120 to zero? No, it stores that pressure up. When the heart pushes the blood in, it stores the pressure so they can be evenly distributed downstream. It's evenly distributed downstream. Does the already decide how much blood goes to the heart or the kidney or the brain? No. What are the name of the structures that determine the resistance and the flow? The arterioles, you know, the resistance vessels. What were the three main factors of resistance? Radius, length, and the viscosity, right? So which one do you have the most influence over? The radius, right? It takes a while to grow a new blood vessel, so length takes a while to do. And as far as the thickness, it takes some time to make your blood thicker and thicker. So even if you made a slice and they kept bleeding, is it actually thinning the blood? No, you're just getting less volume. The blood's the same viscosity. So it takes time to actually do that. But radius, a little jerk or a little boost of, uh, of adrenaline, Psst. what happens to the blood vessel? Psst. Squeezes right away. What happened to the radius? It shrank. What happened to the resistance? It went up. What happened to the flow? It went down. So you have to be able to use those different concepts and apply them and put them together. And then we talked about, actually I'm going to go back here a little bit. We talked about what was happening with the different pressures, and there were four of them. They either did one of two things. All four pressures did one of two things. They either did what compared to the blood? They, what's pushing it out called? They either filtered the blood, ultrafiltration, or they reabsorbed something into the blood, which is reabsorption. You have to be familiar with those pressures. So if I have this capillary blood pressure that's pushing out of the blood, what process is that? Pushing out. It's filtering the blood. It's ultrafiltration. Would you put a plus or a minus sign there? Minus, minus because it's taking it away from your, your, yeah, your blood. What was the word that I used the other day? Your reference point. You're taking it away from your reference point. So if you take it away from the blood, which is the reference point, you subtract it. What about this? What'd that little pi sign stand for? I told you to think about the proteins, but there was a C word that kind of colloids. Yep. So when you talked about the colloids, the things that are trying to pull water back into the blood, what's that? Filtration or reabsorption? What kind of sign would you put in front of it? Plus. Yep, you put a positive sign. Why is there, out here in the interstitial fluid, in a normal healthy person, why is the pi zero? Because what shouldn't be out there? What should not have leaked through the wall of this membrane? Proteins shouldn't have leaked through, so you shouldn't have those proteins out there, so this pressure should be zero. In a situation like edema, what if I crank this up to 10? What's going to happen? More filtration or more reabsorption? So if I crank this number here, the interstitial fluid colloid, I get more filtration. What's happening to my blood? Is it getting thinner or thicker? It's getting, well, if it's losing more water, it's getting thicker, right? So what's happening to the tissue space if it keeps filling it up with more and more water. It gets swollen. What's that process of swelling the tissue? Edema. So you get edema. When you look at these different numbers, overall on the side that's closest to the heart where the blood's pushing out of the heart and pushing forward, you get more of a what? A filtration or reabsorption process. Closer to the heart, what do you want to try and do? Do you want to pull things into the blood or do you want to push things out of the blood? This nice fresh blood, you want to try and push nutrients out, you want to push oxygen out. Over here on the other side, what should you have? More filtering or more reabsorbing? Right, so after the capillaries, you want to start pulling all that extra stuff back in. So if you didn't use that material you pushed out, you want to recollect it in the blood so the next organ can get it. Get it. The same t time, if you push something out here and it metabolizes and makes something like lactic acid or CO2, why do you want that reabsorbed into the blood? Why would you want lactic acid and CO2 reabsorbed into the blood from this tissue? So you can get rid of it. So you can take it back to things like the kidney and the liver, clean it up and get rid of it. Or where are you taking CO2 to? The lungs. So you want that filtration closest to the heart. So where the pressure is the highest, you want it to reabsorb when it's further away from the heart when you're trying to recollect the bad stuff. Is this an even exchange? What you push out on this side is exactly what you pull back in? No. No, you have something extra that leaks out here. So in a situation like this, if you have these extra proteins that are floating around here that shouldn't be here, they're going to pull water. Do you want swelling at the tissue? No, you don't want that swelling because that swelling can block things off downstream. 
If this is in the brain, do you want swelling? No, because there's no room for what? Expansion, so you're going to compress the brain. You don't want the swelling. So you've got this emergency backup flow. It's kind of like the storm drains along the street. If the, drains, or if the street starts filling up with water, the storm drains do what? They carry that extra water away. Those are your lymphatics. So if you push too much fluid into the tissue, the lymphatics collect that extra fluid and take it back up to the heart. This is kind of an interesting thing that will make you think a little bit. So when you look at the lymphatics themselves, they have a couple purposes. One purpose is that they house a lot of the immune structures. So they're home for the immune system, so a lot of blood cells are, are hanging out in there. They have those specialized structures that are big wad. What are they called? And you can feel them when, there's, when you're sick, they swell. The lymph nodes. Those are filled with white bl blood cells. Why? They're like waiting to sabotage any bacteria. That's, if you have bacteria that's collecting out here in the tissue, I keep going back here, that's collecting in the tissue, like I get a cut and the bacteria comes in, this is a high pressure system. This is a low pressure system. Where's the bacteria want to go? Does it want to go to the high pressure or the low pressure? Just like everything else, it's lazy, right? It wants to go to the low pressure. This is like the lazy river. This is like walking into a fire hydrant. So the bacteria is going to cruise over here to the lymphatics and it's going to take the lazy river downstream until it gets to what structures? The lymph nodes were what's waiting to ambush it? The white blood cells. So this is kind of a cool process, the way the lymphatics work. It's like this emergency backup system. It's also any debris that collects in your tissue can move over into the lymphatics and it goes scooting upstream until it finally gets to a lymph node and can be cleaned up or processed. Right, so you want to think of that as like an emergency backup drainage. It's also there for collecting bacteria or any debris that gets into your tissue. Right, and then the different structures we're going to talk about, the initial lymphatics or the beginnings of the lymphatics. The lymphatic system is not a circulatory system. What do you know about a circulatory system? What's the word telling you? It goes in a complete circle. There's no, no real ending and no real beginning. You can start at any point and go in a complete circle. How many directions? Just one, right? It always goes in the same direction when you're talking circulatory system. The lymphatics have an initial lymphatics, which means the first part. There's definitely a beginning, which also means there must be a definite ending. When you're looking at the initial lymphatics, they're actually woven all over in the capillary beds. So here you can see the circulatory system coming all the way around, circling back up. When you look at the initial lymphatics, they start at the capillary beds of the tissues. They collect all this extra debris, they collect all this extra fluid. Any extra proteins that leak out, they can recollect those. They pull them back up into the lymph node, gets clean, processed, if it's a bacteria or an invader. And then it takes that clean and processed fluid, moves it all the way back and dumps it into what's this major blood vessel right here? The vena cava. And then it goes immediately into the right atrium. So this is kind of the dirty little secret. What's nice is that the bacteria gets collected here. The bacteria is killed and processed, and the debris from the bacteria gets dumped in the bloodstream, and then it goes into the vena cava, and you can clean it up with the liver and everything. But when you eat like big, greasy, fatty cheeseburgers with the big double helping of fries, oh my god, I went to Capitol Pub the other night and had two hot dogs there. I was totally splurging, and they were both deep fried. Oh, terrible. So I'm just as guilty. But when I ate those, that fatty, nasty stuff, when it gets into your GI tract, your GI tract is tissue, right? So it's filled with capillaries. When you start absorbing that fat, that fat can actually leak straight into your lymphatics. Normally when you absorb things in the GI tract, it's carried up to what major organ that cleans that stuff? The liver. Fats don't have to do that. Most of the fats are actually going to seep into the lymphatics because is there any barrier saying that they can't go into other cells? They're fats. They can penetrate right through any cell. So they move right into the lymphatics. They go sliding up here. They hang out in the lymph nodes a little bit, and they move on further. The bacteria doesn't care, or bacteria. The white blood cell doesn't care about the fats. What's it looking for? It's looking for bacteria, right? So things that are, are like invaders. Fats are normal stuff in your body. So then the fat goes right on by, comes cruising up further into the lymph vessels, and gets dumped where? Into the vena cava, which goes where? Right into your heart. Right? So it goes directly into your heart. That fat doesn't have to get cleaned and processed by the liver. That fat just goes straight in. So when you do eat those two big deep fried hot dogs and the fries that came with it, I didn't have fries, so I wasn't so sinful. But that uncomfortable feeling where you're like, ugh, you just feel like crap afterwards. Like you, you almost can't breathe and it almost feels like your heart has to pump harder. Guess what? It is. Because you're coating all that oil all those lipids all over the place in here, they're going around the lungs, they're going everywhere. You're slowly cleaning that crap up. So yeah, 
that was two nights ago, and so ever since then I've been eating a lot of like fiber and fruities, like juice, fruit juice or stuff, I'm trying to make up for it. it. Doesn't matter. Well, I already got my body. I'm just trying to uh, make myself feel better. So tomorrow I can go out and have a shamrock shake. Huh? Wind vessels, they could, but actually it's a nice flow that it just dumps up here. And if they do build up plaque, you're not going to see the results as much as you, you see with a, so like a regular blood vessel. Why you get, you get cancer of lymph nodes and it's really serious because that just is, that can be spread the whole body just as quickly. Yeah, if, you, if your cancer metastasizes into a lymph node, it can just work its way right, right back up because what's the <coughs> ultimate goal of these fluids? These lymphatics are trying to dump stuff where? Into the, into the blood primarily, but yeah, you're right, it goes to the heart. But if a cancer cell, a metastasized cancer cell, seeps out of this tissue and gets in here, it can come cruising up. And if the white blood cells don't kill it, it just cruises right up into the circulation. Where's it going now? Anywhere it wants. Yep, once it's in the heart and in the blood flow, it can go anywhere it wants. That's why a lot of times when people get breast cancer, and even if they do a total mastectomy, what do they have to worry about like five years later? The lymph having carried some of those loose cells to what part? Anybody know where the second major place that, that breast tissue cancers want to go? The heart, or sorry, goes to the brain and then the lungs, right? So a lot of times they worry about a brain cancer after that. There's something about the tissue, and it's called organotrophy, where a cancer cell likes the breast tissue. There's something about the environment that it's more likely to go to another tissue that's like breast tissue that has a lot of fat in it, so it has a tendency to go up into the brain and make itself a new home. That's pathophysiology, but it's an interesting kind of thing to think about. The lymphatics are a major carrier of those cancer cells that metastasize. No, there's no specific time period, but yeah, it seems like a lot of them within five years will pop back up again in the brain. Okay, so that's the lymphatic pathway. What do you call the lymph fluid? Lymph. Yep, no trick to it. So you've got the vessels, the initial lymphatics, and the lymph is the actual <laughs> fluid. And I think we covered all three of those. Yep. Okay, and then here's a picture of the capillaries. You can see your arterial going into, what are these little structures that transition into the capillary beds? The met arterioles, right? And what should I see wrapped around met arterioles? Sphincter. This precapillary sphincter, right. And it goes in through the capillaries. It does, this, what's the capillary there for? <laughs> Site of exchange, yep. So it does this exchange, it dumps out the good oxygen, good nutrients, picks up the bad stuff, the CO2, brings it back into the venules and goes forward. All that extra fluid that's around in this interstitial fluid can go into the lymphatics and get carried up. Right? This is kind of cool the way the lymphatics are designed. It's kind of designed like a blood vessel, but not the same. So it's made with simple squamous cells, which means how many layers? One. What shape? Squashed, right? Flat. And instead of butting up against each other like the blood vessels do, they actually overlap slightly. So they work like a valve. When you have extra fluid out here, the fluid can get pushed in, so it pushes this little flap down and moves in that way. But if it tries to come back up, that pressure pushes on this flap and seals that shut. So you have one-way movement. It goes into the lymph vessel and it can only go up and towards the heart. So you can see it over here, it flows in, and as the pressure accumulates in here, it pushes that flap shut so that it has to move upstream. So it's a really cool design. There's no smooth muscle around it, so you don't have to worry about that. It's a very, very low pressure, too. So it makes it better for the bacteria to go right into it because it's low pressure. They can slide in, think, ooh, slip and slide, and go screaming on downstream. Right. So the major functions, I already talked about a couple of these. So it returns excess fluid to the heart, actually to the circulation in general. You have white blood cells hanging in there, waiting to kill bacteria or any kind of invader, like a virus. They're there for transporting absorbed fat, which we'll talk about more in the digestive system. And then they're there to return any filtered protein. So any proteins that go through out of the blood, which get filtered and slide out, if they get out there, should they be out there in the interstitial fluid? Should the proteins be loose in the interstitial fluid? No. So the lymphatics, hopefully they'll go into the lymphatic and get carried back up to the blood and return to the blood. If those proteins hang out in the, in the interstitial fluid, what do they want to attract? They want to attract water, right? So they want to attract the water and pull it in, which would cause what? edema. So it causes, you can actually have lots of causes of edema. So you can have reduced concentration of plasma proteins, which means you don't have very many plasma proteins in the blood. So what's that tell you about the water? Does it want to stay in the blood? No. Those proteins are like magnets. If you barely have any proteins there, the water doesn't want to stay there either. 
What's the name of the organ that makes those proteins that this person might have a problem with? I wondered if you'd remember this. I told you definitely write this down before when I talked about things like um, proteins in your blood, albumins. I mentioned it in lab last week again. Liver. It's the liver. So if somebody has liver damage, can they make those proteins? Nope. So are they going to have an easy time retaining water in their blood? Nope. So they get things like edema because the water seeps out into the tissues or they urinate a lot of that water out so they get more dehydrated. It depends on, yeah, it depends on how much damage in that situation because alcoholic can have damage to anything. But if it's an alcoholic with cirrhosis to the liver, yeah, then you see that kind of situation where they have a problem making proteins. So liver damage is a good example of this. Or what else? What do you make proteins out of? Amino acids. Where do you get amino acids at? Most of them you get from your diet. So malnutrition might cause that too. Number two, increased permeability of the capillary walls. So what chemical did we talk about that causes those capillary walls to open up a little bit? So it normally causes vasodilation, but it will also cause the capillary walls to open. Because you can't vasodilate a capillary, you just, they call it endothelial retraction. It opens up a little bit more. What's the name of the chemical? Vasodilation, I know you know it, and as soon as it comes out, you're gonna go, oh, duh. Histamine. Yep, it's histamine. So when you're exposed to histamine, histamine opens up those capillaries. It allows proteins to seep out and also allows more water to seep out. So what symptom do you get with a lot of histamine in an area? Swelling, right? So you get localized edema. If that histamine is all over in your blood, what happens to you? It causes massive vasodilation and it could potentially cause shock. What kind of shock is that? Anaphylactic. So now you have a cause for that one. Number three, increased venous pressure. So if the veins are squeezing too hard, what's it going to do to flow? It's going to decrease the flow. So what's going to happen? It's going to get backed up downstream, right? So up here, or sorry, upstream, back here where the blood's trying to pump, now I've got this vein that's squeezed down a lot. Can the blood flow really well through that vein? Nope. So it's going to start backing up. The, way, the time you usually see this is when people are working on their feet all day and they're stressed out and their, their veins are kind of squeezed. Where's the blood start accumulating at? Down towards the feet, right? And that causes those veins down there to start swelling up and eventually they might become like bent, twisted, get kind of like distended and we call those what? Varicose veins. And that's why they usually get edema around those things too. And then number four, blockage of the lymph vessels. And I, ah, uh, yeah, I used to have a picture on here, but I took it off. But there was a, an intense picture. And uh, if, if you go to, like, other countries and you walk around barefoot, a lot of times these people get, it's, it's basically a worm. It's a parasite that gets in their foot. It goes into the lymphatics because where do things that get in your system want to go? Do they want to go to the blood immediately or do they want to go to the lymphatics if it's easier? If it's easier, they go in the lymphatics. And these things love the lymphatics, this little parasite. So it goes cruising up. It hangs out in the lymph node. It builds a nest in the lymph node. So it makes babies in there, builds a home that starts swelling up. And then what's going to happen to all the flow that's trying to go into that lymph node if it's blocked up? Think of a, a beaver. When they build a dam, what happens to all of the water? Yeah, it gets backed up. So now you get swelling downstream of that, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So when you've heard of things like elephantitis where they're lower limbs start swelling up and they look gigantic, that would be an example. Blocking those lymph vessels means that they can't get that extra flow up through and so all that fluid accumulates around their feet. And it's interesting because the first signs of this are that their feet swell. And then after their feet, then it turns into their calves start swelling. And after the calves, then their, their upper thighs start swelling. And then their genitalia will actually swell. Like in mint, the picture I had before, I actually had a man and his testicles were big and everybody was like, oh my God. And I thought, eh, I better take it out, just in case. I mean, we're health professionals, but there was so much, yeah. I thought, this is going to be bad. But it, all those lymph vessels, as what's happening with this parasite, why is it getting from the feet to the calves to the thigh and up? It's replicating, and, the, and it sends its babies basically to the next site, and then it just keeps moving upstream. Yeah. See? I didn't have to have the picture, and people were giggling. 
it doesn't have to be, but yeah, that's. I just gave you an example. Uh, a tumor could be a, a cause for blockage. So if you have a tumor growing in there, that would block it too. Oh, you mean like the faked TV show ER? Gotcha. Oh yeah. It would break and. That's awesome. Yeah, YouTube has a lot of those really interesting videos. <sighs> Don't even give me. I'm not even gonna talk about Grey's Anatomy. Next structures, veins and venules. I watched one episode of that and I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. And then I had to watch another one just recently and. I, I just, I was absolutely convinced, yes. It's weird that the surgeons do nurses work. Do you ever notice that? Yeah, whatever. I, did, I haven't watched enough to know that. Yeah. So veins and venules, which one comes first in the pathway? The venules, yep. So capillaries to venules and then to the veins. It's just like you take a, a river and it breaks into small streams and the little creeks and then those creeks build back into streams and then back into the flowing river. Right, when you look at the veins, though, that's what we're going to focus on. We call those the capacitance vessels because they hold a lot of volume. And the venous capacity is about 60% of your blood. So any time when you're looking where the blood's at, about 60% of that blood is actually in the veins. Is it just sitting there? No, it's moving. It's just these vessels are so large on the inside, their lumen is so big that they can hold more volume. All right. And then things that cause venous return. So these are things that help you do what? Was it called afterload, contractility, or preload? It's the preload. It's the venous returns talking about returning it back to the heart. So it's filling the heart. This is focusing on preload. We talked about some of these before. Sympathetic stimulation. It squeezes the veins a little bit and causes them to do what? Push the blood backwards. What prevents backflow? The valves. Yep, so the veins, remember, have valves that the other blood vessels don't. Oh, I forgot to mention that, though. Lymphatics have valves. Dang, I totally forgot to mention that. So... Why would lymphatics need valves? Because they're very low pressure. They need something to prevent the backflow. They're very low pressure. Where in the system do valves show up in the system? In the veins. In the veins, yeah. And except for in the brain. Anybody know what's so special about the brain? It has gravity. Yeah, you don't need veins in the or valves in the veins in the in the brain because you have gravity pulling it down. So sympathetic stimulation, a little bit of what chemical? Psst, psst, psst. Epi or norepinephrine, right? So you get a little bit of that adrenaline going, and then it squeezes it down, increasing your preload. Skeletal muscle activity, just by squeezing your skeletal muscles, you squeeze those veins that are in between them, and what's it going to do? Push the blood backwards? It has to push it up. It's like this. You're walking along. Every time that you contract a muscle, it bulges, right? So as it's bulging, it squeezes these blood vessels that are inside of it, and what it's going to do is pump it from this section to the next, to the next, to the next, until you finally get it all the way back up to the heart. So here's an example of how that works. If I didn't have the valves, it would flow backwards, right? But I squeeze this muscle here, and it pushes it up and in here. And as soon as I relax that muscle, what happens? Can it, can it flow backwards? Nope, it's just like the heart. When the heart contracts, it pushes the pressure upwards. Gush! And then as soon as I let, relax the heart, the pressure drops in here. Where's that blood want to go? It wants to come back in, but can it? No. Nope, because that valve shuts. But as I open this up, I was right, expand it again. What's going to happen to this valve? It opens. It's a suction process. It's like a straw sucking it from this chamber to the next one, and from this chamber to the next one. So, I mean, if they had really thought about this, they should make special valve straws for milkshakes, right? So you could, like, go suck a little bit up and take a break and then try again. And just get a little bit after a little bit after a little bit. So you're constantly moving this blood from this section to the next and then to the next every time you take a step. Not just when you walk. What are you doing 24 hours a day that's moving skeletal muscle? Breathing, right? So every time you breathe, it's going to move it, too. Let's go back to the, the list, make sure I get them all. And then the effects of gravity. What's gravity trying to do? Pull down. Pull down. Where would the effect of gravity actually increase venous return? In the brain. Yep. So gravity is going to pull it down out of the brain and back into the heart. And then the valves, of course, that prevent 
back flow. Yeah. And then respiratory activity, this is a cool process you probably never thought about before, but every time you, you take a breath, <gasps> what do you do to the pressure in your thoracic cavity? You squeeze everything around the lungs, right? So you're actually compressing everything. The heart doesn't get smashed very easily because it's a strong muscle. But when you think, what's that major blood vessel that's in the thoracic cavity that's going to get smashed every time you breathe? The vena cava. You go, <gasps> and it smashes the vena cava because it's low pressure, right? What's it doing? Pushing the blood back to your feet? Nope, it's pushing it up, right? So it's pushing it up and into the right atrium. So respiratory activity, every time you breathe, it's squeezing all the structures in the thoracic cavity and the lowest pressure ones are going to be compressed, like the vena cava. And then this last thing is cardiac suction. So every time the heart relaxes, remember, for refilling. Contract it, and then, and it's cardiac suction, but again, I think I mentioned this before, in science there really is no such thing as sucking. It's called negative pressure. Right? Science doesn't suck, it just has negative pressure. All right, I think I showed these. Oh, and then this situation, what's happening here? Why does it help for people to lie down when, they're, when they have blood rushing down to their feet? Why do they want to lie down? Because they don't have to worry about gravity pulling into their feet. Gravity actually evenly distributes the blood all throughout their body. So it's going to help return it back here. So if I ask you a question like this, which of the following is false? <coughs> false about veins. So do veins store about 60% of your blood? Yep. How about number two? Parasympathetic activation causes constriction in the veins and mobilizes the stored blood. Correct. This is false because it should be sympathetic. Is the parasympathetic going to have any influence over the veins? No. Number three, just double check. Skeletal muscle contracts, helping increase venous return? Yeah. Yep. It's like squeezing it, pumping it forward. How about veins bring blood into the heart? Is that true? Do veins always bring blood to the heart? Yeah. Yes. They're always bringing it to the heart. Okay, and then your blood pressure, now we're going to start looking at those vessels again. Blood pressure regulated by controlling the cardiac output, the TPR, and the blood volume. All right, so if you can manipulate these different things, you can, well, actually if you manipulate blood pressure, you manipulate all three of these things. But there are two major characteristics. Your blood pressure has to be high enough that it actually pushes blood into the heart, but it can't be so high that it does what? It tries to push the blood backwards in the wrong direction. Remember? If you have too much pressure on your aorta, what's your aorta going to try and do? It's going to try and push it back into the heart. What's that called? Preload, contractility, or afterload? That's the afterload, trying to push it back in. What's the heart going to have to do to try and overcome that pressure? It's going to have to pump harder. So you need the pressure high enough that you drive the blood forward into the tissues and also help venous return and bring it back into the heart, but you can't have it so high that it creates more work for the heart. So blood pressure has an overall input on the cardiac or effect on the cardiac output, the TPR, and the blood volume. So this is a really scary slide. But if you went back and looked through all the slides we've talked about before, you'd see each one of these pieces are small little bits. So there would be like this section on one slide, this section on another slide, this section on another slide, and it's all leading back to what we're doing to our mean arterial pressure. So I know we had this one before where we started with this. We talked about the sympathetic nervous system. We talked about how it influences venous return. We talked about how it influences stroke volume, how it influences heart rate, and how that influences cardiac output. I know later we were talking about blood viscosity, and we talked about red blood cells or the lack of what influencing blood viscosity. This was just Tuesday, or was it Tuesday? Water, lack of water, right? Losing water increases viscosity. And we also talked about what happens with arterial radius, so how we can influence that. Now we've just talked about, uh, is it this section here? Yeah. So blood volume, respiratory activity, and skeletal muscle activity. All of these things affect your venous return. We talked about cardiac suction. So that list that I had on the other page are all influencing this venous return. Sympathetic activity influences the venous return. When you change the preload, you automatically change what? End diastolic or instastolic volume? I know I had to write it down before when we covered this. End diastolic volume or end systolic volume? Preload. What are you doing during preload? You're filling. So what's the heart doing when it's filling? It's relaxing. So would that be end diastolic or end systolic? The end diastolic volume. When you change your EDV, you automatically change your stroke volume. If you change your stroke volume, you automatically change your cardiac output. If you change your cardiac output, you automatically change your mean arterial pressure. Remember that equation we looked at on Tuesday? 
how can you use this, this, and this? Do you remember what it was? This is the what in that flow pressure or resistance. This is pressure, and it says it right there. This is what? The resistance, and it says it right there. So this must be what? Your flow. If you change any of these three things, you change that equation. Your flow, your pressure, and your resistance. So you kind of have to look at the big picture, and I'm not telling you memorize this. As long as you understand each of the individual pieces, you can see their overall impact on these factors. So each of these pieces influence things like resistance. Each of them influence cardiac output. And if you change either of those, you automatically affect your mean arterial pressure. OK. So that was the big picture. We put piece after piece after piece after piece together. But you should be able to try and imagine how that works as a big picture. Actually, I'm going to do one more thing. So if I change my skeletal mu muscle activity, does it have any influence on your mean arterial pressure? Yes. Yes. Does it have any influence on your TPR? Yes, you can see the pathway. Skeletal muscle has a, an effect on peripheral resistance. Does it have any effect on cardiac output? Yes. So just think of the pathway. Skeletal muscle, I just said, you squeeze the veins. The veins are going to do what? Push the blood into the heart. And when you push more blood into the heart, what's that effect? What P word? Preload. Preload directly affects what? End systolic or diastolic? End diastolic, which affects your what volume? Each heartbeat, your stroke volume. And when you change your stroke volume, you change what over a minute? Cardiac, Cardiac output. output for each minute. So, so the there's... Like the Say what? Right oh, no. So these are all contributing factors to venous return. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then it's interesting because when you look at this pathway too, skeletal muscle activity, what are you doing to metabolism? You're increasing your metabolism, right? So when you increase the metabolism, remember how we said metabolism influences arterial radius and what other little structures? Met localized metabolism. Pre-capillary sphincters, yep. So when you change the size of those, does it have any influence on radius? Duh, I said the wrong thing. Yes, it's the radius. What does it have an effect on? When you change radius, you automatically affect your resistance, which affects your blood flow. So you can look at all those pieces together. I heard something. Say that you lost me somewhere. It's in the think of it in the ventricles. When we talked about before, it was the ventricles, like the ventricles squeeze and push the blood out, but to refill, they actually look and pull back in. Okay, so regulating. Short-term regulators, you have the baroreceptors. What are they detecting? Baroreceptors. Pressure, like a barometer, right? So baroreceptors are detecting pressure. What kind of pressure do you think we're talking about? Blood pressure, right? We're still in the blood and the blood vessels, so it's blood pressure. When you look at these, there are two locations. There's the carotid sinus and the aortic arch right here. So carotid sinus determining the pressure going where? In the brain, and then the aortic arch determining the pressure going to the rest of the body. So the brain's so important it has its own receptor. Why would you want a receptor detecting pressure going into the brain? What are you afraid of? Blowing out capillaries and blood vessels in the brain, right? Your brain has very delicate tissue in there. There's not as much skeletal muscle giving structure to those blood vessels, right? Skeletal muscle supports deep veins. That's why deep veins, it's hard to really get like spider vein effects. But the veins that you see that get spider veins or varicose veins are the ones on the surface that aren't surrounded by muscle. When you look in the brain, it's surrounded by fatty, squishy brain tissue. Is there a lot of support there? No, it's like having a garden hose or fire hose running through jello. Okay. And then cardiovascular control center, of course, you know is where? Medulla oblongata. So when you look at short-term regulation, is this intrinsic or extrinsic regulation? It's extrinsic because what system are we talking about right here? A baroreceptor and the medulla oblongata. It's the nervous system controlling the blood, blood pressure, right? So this is an extrinsic control. This is short term. If my blood pressure goes up, what's going to happen to the firing rate of those little receptors? They're going to go faster, right? Remember, they're not saying pressure's at 120, pressure's at 10, pressure's at whatever. They're telling the brain how high your blood pressure is by their firing rate, the frequency, right? So they're going beep, 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 
beep, then your blood pressure goes up, and what's it going to do? It's going to go beep, 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 and fire fast. What's the medulla going to think? That's way too high of a frequency. What's it going to tell your sympathetic nervous system? Slow down. Slow down. What's, it, what's the sympathetic nervous system going to slow its release of? Epinephrine, norepinephrine. What's going to happen to the size of the blood vessels? They're going to dilate. What's going to happen to the pressure as a result? It's going to go down. So it goes from beep, beep, beep to beep, 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 beep. Medulla oblongata says that's too fast, turns down the sympathetic nervous system, and now it's back down to beep, beep, beep. Now what's wrong? It's too slow. So now what's the medulla oblongata going to do? Say so go a little faster, release some more adrenaline. goes beep, 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 beep. What's that process of maintaining that equilibrium called? It's homeostasis. It's not perfect, though. Homeostasis is not a flat, straight line. Homeostasis is this weavy line. Because you're constantly, by the time that you change the blood pressure, and that signal gets back to the medulla oblongata, you've overshot your goal. So the medulla oblongata has to reverse that completely, and then you overshoot your goal the other way. So that line is actually this weavy line. It's not a perfectly still line. And here's the pathway. So if you increase your blood pressure, it increases the firing rate of the baroreceptors, which increases the action potentials. The cardiovascular control center, the what? Where is it at? Medulla oblongata sends messages to increase parasympathetic and decrease the sympathetic. Why is it increasing the parasympathetic? To affect the blood vessels? No. no. What's it trying to affect? It decreases. It decreases what rate? So if I increase the parasympathetic, I'm trying to decrease what rate? Heart rate, right? Because the parasympathetic can do what to the heart? Slow the heart rate, which is going to do what to your blood pressure? It's also going to lower your blood pressure. So this is kind of putting the heart and the blood vessels together in one equation. So parasympathetic, is it influencing the blood vessels? No, but it can influence what cardiovascular structure? The heart. Yep, so it's going to slow down your heart rate. It's affecting the SA node and the AV node. The decrease in sympathetics is not going to speed up your heart rate, but it's going to do what to your blood vessels? It's going to help dilate the blood vessels. Can it do anything to the heart? If I decrease the sympathetic, sympathetic had two influences on the heart. It increases heart rate, but it also increases right the quickness and the AV. There's one other major cell I'm looking at it influencing <coughs> that the parasympathetic didn't influence. The contractile cells. Mm -hmm. When I increase my sympathetic, it increases my heart rate and it increases my contractility, right? If I decrease the sympathetic, what's it doing to power that I'm squeezing the blood out of the heart? Making it softer. What's happening to my pressure as a result? It goes down too. There's a big picture you have to look at. So when you talk about parasympathetic, you want to think straight to the heart. Do you want to think about the blood vessels right now? No. Nope. When you think about sympathetic, do you want to think blood vessels? Absolutely, because they're the major influence of the radius size of the blood vessel. Do you want to think about the heart with the sympathetic? Does it have a big influence on the heart? It does. You think heart rate and contractility. If you turn down the sympathetic, what two things did you just turn down? Heart rate and contractility. So number three, as a result, it causes a decrease in heart rate, a decrease in what's SV? Stroke volume. My stroke volume went down. Duh. If you drop heart rate, right, you drop your pressure, you drop your stroke volume. What big thing did these things, two things affect? If you take this times that, it's your cardiac output. So right away, you know you did what to your cardi cardiac output? You decreased it. So all these things are overall looking at cardiac output. If I relax my blood vessels, what did I just do to the resistance, the total peripheral resistance? Yep, if you open up the radius, you increase the size inside, you did what to your resistance? You dropped it. And then what's overall going to happen to your blood pressure as a result? It goes down. Think more globally about all the influences that the sympathetic could have. You know, and we're going to come back to this later when we talk about the kidney. The sympathetic nervous system is going to cause the blood vessels in the kidney to do what? Sympathetic. If I stimulate the sympathetic, what's it going to do to the blood vessels going into the kidney? Constrict them. By the way, what are the names of the blood vessels going into the kidney? Arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, or veins? Going into the actual organ. Arterial holes, right? So the arterioles, if I stimulate them with adrenaline, what do they do? They squeeze. What's that going to do to the flow through the kidney? It's going to slow it. What's going to be happen to your urine output? It slows it down. 
That's why when you're exercising really hard, you don't just midway through exercise go, oh man, I gotta pee, hold on. So everybody stop and you leave. Usually when you get on the treadmill and you're like, oh, I gotta take a leak, it's right when you get on. And I think that's more of an excuse for getting off, right? But yeah, that's why runners, they can run like a marathon, they don't go, oh crap, you know, I gotta take a leak, hold on a second. When your sympathetic nervous system is going like that, what's it doing to the flow through the kidneys? Slowing it down, so it's slowing down the production. So you're going to want to think more globally. Every time we talk about an organ, think about what's the sympathetic going to do to this? Now you can think what's the sympathetic do to the blood vessels going into it. The only organ that's not going to be like that is what organ? So sympathetic is going to squeeze down the blood vessels so that you don't get very good flow through the kidneys. If you stimulate, if you stimulate the GI tract, it's going to turn down the flow through the GI tract, which is okay because the sympathetic is already turning down the GI tract activity, but the only organ that's not directly affected is the brain. Yep. The brain always has a consistent uh, pressure going through it all the time, unless it's a disease situation. Yeah, Tiffany. Where do you see that? Oh, this is the, initially you have an increase, you have a high blood pressure is the initial factor. But decreasing the sympathetic, you're trying to, as a final result, down here, you're decreasing that pressure. So if your blood pressure is too high here, this is what happens in your body. It it does slow slow down the uh, the pressure a little bit by affecting the heart rate. Yeah. Yep. So when we talk about sympathetic, you need to think of all of its effects on every system. So this is the cardiovascular. This, uh, when we talked about activity like, uh, well, actually we've only talked about muscles and nervous system, haven't we? I mentioned the kidney. But every time we come, keep coming back to this, you want to keep thinking, what's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic doing to these organs? What's the sympathetic doing to your cardiovascular system? It's increasing your heart rate, increasing your heart contractility. It's increasing your blood vessel constriction. What's the final result? Are all those things okay? Do people live real well with really high blood pressure and overactive sympathetic nervous system? They're both happy for a short time, yeah, and then things just keep getting worse. But this is a short-term fix. This is just to get you out of a bad situation. If you increase parasympathetic, it only has an effect on the heart. It decreases the heart rate. It has no effect on the blood vessels that you need to know right now. So if you like those flow charts, everything we just talked about is in a flow chart. So parasympathetic stimulation on his heart, what's it do to heart rate? drops it. So as soon as you drop heart rate, what do you know is going to happen to cardiac output? It decreases. What were the two components of cardiac output? Heart rate and stroke volume, right? So if you decrease the cardiac output, you automatically drop the blood pressure. If you stimulate the sympathetic, what's it do to these veins? Constrict them. What's it going to do to the pressure? Increase it. What's it going to do to venous return? Push it back up because it can't push it where? Can't push it down because of the valves, right? So it pushes more blood in, causing what? What was the P word they keep saying over and over? Preload. So the venous return increases preload. If you put more blood into the heart, what did Frank Starling say? You gotta get it back out. So what's what's the output called? The one heartbeat output is stroke volume, right? What's the over a minute? Cardiac output. So if you increase the venous return, you increase the preload, which means you have to push more out, which increases your stroke volume. If you increase your stroke volume, that's one of the two components that affect cardiac output, so you have to increase cardiac output, overall increasing your blood pressure. If you look at the sympathetic on its arterioles, what are they going to do to the arterioles? Squeeze them. So what's it going to do to your resistance? Squeezing down the blood vessel shrinks the radius, which increases the resistance, raising your blood pressure. If you look at sympathetic on the heart, what's it do to your heart rate? Goes up. What's it do to the heart contractility? Makes it go up. Heart rate times, what's the contractility affecting? The output, st stroke volume. So heart rate times stroke volume is cardiac output. You just raise both of them. What do you have to do to cardiac output? Has to go up. Yep. And then it raises the blood pressure as a result. So you can keep looking at these pathways, and we keep talking about all the pathways over and over again. You just have to, in your mind, when you think of sympathetic, think of all the possibilities. Welcome to medicine. Okay, and then here's just a pathway that you can look at again. So when the blood pressure gets elevated, all the things that happen. Where are the sensors at? The aortic arch and the carotid sinus. Yep. They start firing faster, sends a signal to what? It's the cardiac center, or sorry, cardiovascular center. 
I'm going to do an obligata. And it says, whoa, this is way too high. We need to slow it down. Slow down the sympathetic. Increase the parasympathetic overall, dropping your heart rate, dropping your stroke volume, and then dropping your blood vessel constriction. So as a final result, it reverses that process and drops your blood pressure. What is this pathway called? My initial effect was I had a high blood pressure. I turn on this whole chain of events to lower my blood pressure, stopping this chain of events. Say, what kind of feedback loop? Negative feedback loop. And then this one's just the opposite. So what if your blood pressure drops too low? You can see the different steps. So the big picture here, if bear receptors can detect a high blood pressure, what's going to happen? Which of these would happen? If your bear receptors detect a high blood pressure, how about number four? Nothing happens. No, because high blood pressure is a bad thing. You know homeostasis is going to happen, so you can get rid of number four. How about the somatic nervous system gets increased? What's wrong with that? Somatic has nothing to do with this, right? Somatic's talking about moving skeletal muscles. So number three is wrong. How about which one's right then? Number one or number two? So what would happen if the sympathetic's increased? Heart rate goes up, contractility goes up, vasoconstriction, right? Constricts. What happens to your blood pressure? It gets higher. What would happen to you? Yep, so you have super high blood pressure until you start popping capillaries and your eyes start bleeding. Over-exaggerating, but yeah, it could happen. Did I talk about snake bites in here? I thought I did. That would be a good example. Yeah, space would have been a good example. Um, the snake bite would be another example. That's why they start having b little bursts all over their face and the capillaries and their eyes and the capillaries and everything. So if the, uh, if the sympathetics went up as a result of high blood pressure, what kind of feedback loop would that be? That's a positive. Are those safe? No. no. Absolutely not. So when, I'm sorry, when your child throws up like really, really hard, My child? all their blood pressure vessels pop out in their face, does that have anything to do with pain? Yeah, I have no idea how that has to do with anything. Yeah, it's just probably a lot of pressure. Did their blood vessels pop? Yeah. As a result? Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. <coughs> okay. Other reflex and responses. So this is outside of the central nervous system, but you have the left atrial volume receptors. Where are we talking about? Left atrial volume receptors. We're talking about in the heart, right? This is kind of cool. The left atrial volume receptors, they detect high blood pressure. And if they get too high, they actually release a chemical into your system that helps reduce that. It's called atrial natriuretic peptide, which we'll talk about later. You can write A and P for short so that when you come back and look at it, you know what it is. It's a natriuretic. When you look at that word, it's Na plus uretic. What's it telling you it's doing? What's Na plus make you think? Sodium and uretic means you're urinating it out, right? So a diuretic makes you get rid of lots of water. A natriuretic makes you get rid of lots of sodium. Exactly. So why would the heart make you dump a lot of sodium out through your urine? What's it trying to do? If you get rid of the salt, you get rid of water. If you get rid of the water, you get rid of volume. If you get rid of the volume, you get rid of the pressure. As a result, what did the atria just do? It reduced your blood pressure. It totally bypassed the central nervous system. It went straight to releasing a chemical that travels through your blood. What's that called? A, what is the general term for those chemicals that travel through your blood? Hormones. hormones. It released a hormone that went to the kidney. Your heart said, screw this brain. I'm taking this into my own mat hands. It releases the A and P. It goes down to the kidney. makes you start urinating out salt. And we talked about before, where salt goes, water flows. Yep. So water gets lost too, reducing your blood volume, reducing your blood pressure. The next one's hypothalamic osmoreceptors. <laughs> what are we talking about? This is in the brain, the hypothalamus, remember the four Fs? It's helping regulate water concentrations, which tells you an osmoreceptor. What's it telling? Water percentages, right? So if you have way too much water percentage, it's going to make you release chemicals to get rid of what? Water. Green and angiotensin and aldosterone. That's not this one, but that's like that, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that pathway later, and it'll have to do with the hypothalamus, but in a different yeah. sense. But yeah, exactly. When you're looking at renin angiotensin aldosterone system, it's going to come back and talk about this again. So the hypothalamic osmoreceptor is detecting water concentrations. It's not detecting volume. 
it's detecting the concentration of the water. So you can have a normal volume of water, but still have too much water compared to solute. And these osmoreceptors receptors are going to go, hey, this is wrong. And they're going to try and change it. Next one, chemi or the chemoreceptors detecting chemicals in your blood. You have a central and peripheral. When you're looking at the central, it's in the hypothalamus. When you're looking at peripheral, it's going to be in the same two places you have baroreceptors, which are where? The cryosinus and the aortic arch. Yep. Look at all these mechanisms to control blood pressure. Must be pretty dangerous stuff. Number three, cardiovascular response associated with certain behaviors and emotions. You ever thought the wrong thought and your heart starts beating faster, your blood pressure goes up? So it's a psychological effect. Number four, pronounced cardiovascular changes accompanying exercise. You jump on a treadmill, you start running. This is an interesting one too because is this, is this bad for you? No. No, this is good because it's very short, right? But when I was talking about the kidney, this is going to be one of those places. When you jump on the treadmill and you start running like crazy, your blood pressure will go up. It's going to start affecting certain organs. Where is it trying to get the blood pressure or blood to? Muscles. To the muscles, right? So it's going to start doing what to your GI tract? It's trying to crimp off those blood vessels, the GI tract, and your kidneys because that way you're not digesting food and you're not producing urine so much. Right? So exercise is going to affect your blood pressure too. Number five, hypothalamic control center over cutaneous articles. What's cutaneous referring to? The skin. So the hypothalamus can actually control skin. When you get into pathophysiology, it's fun because we just talked about this last week, but you have three steps that are in controlling like thoughts and emotions. And your hypothalamus is actually this regulator. You ever really made somebody angry? And you know their animal instinct is that they are really angry, but their frontal lobe says, you know, this is the wrong thing to do is to pummel that person to death. But the hypothalamus is saying, screw it, because the hypothalamus is like, telling you visible signs that they are pissed off. What's it doing? Making their face turn red. red. What's happening in their blood pressure? They're going, ha, 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 But you know that their blood pressure is going through the roof, right? So the hypothalamus can actually affect things, and it shows signs in places like your skin. It, oh, it, what's it do to those blood vessels on the skin? It starts dilating. It's pushing the blood vessels in here so tight that it's actually pushing the blood out to the surface of the skin. And the number six, vasoactive substances. Can you think of a couple? What's a vasoactive substance that's released by the endothelial cells? I gave you two. What's the one that vasodilates? Or, sorry. Uh, exactly. Nitric oxide. I was trying to think, of how, can I, how can I hint at Viagra without actually saying the Viagra again? But nitric oxide, it's released by the endothelial cells to actually cause them to vasodilate. What's the other one that's like a, like a snake venom, huh? Uh, it's called... And it looks like where it comes from. It comes from endothelial cells, and it's called endothelin. So those are vasoactive substances that can affect your blood pressure. Obviously, if endothelin comes out, what's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's causing vasoconstriction. Raise your blood pressure. If nitric oxide comes out, vasodilates. And you've ever watched Thousand Ways to Die? Yes. There was an episode about a guy that was having an affair on his anniversary. Oh, yeah. He, uh, yeah, his wife slipped him some Viagra so that after that they could go home and have a good time and after they went out for dinner and then his, his mistress called and he like ducked out and he took two Viagra on his own and his mistress went and had to have a good time so she gave him two without telling him and so he had five Viagra in his system. Yep. And his blood vessels just started dilating like crazy. So what happened to him? He wasn't getting enough, yeah, shock. He wasn't getting enough blood to the brain and the heart and he died. So, Yeah. I bet it was. I bet it hurt pretty bad, too. I, yeah, I bet he didn't have a good time. <laughs> and then hypertension. What? This is a fancy word for what happening? High, High blood, pressure. blood pressure. Yeah. This is what sucks about hypertension, chronic hypertension. If you have acute hypertension, you jump on a treadmill, you run, you have an acute hypertension, right? Your blood pressure goes up. But is it bad? No. No, your body adapts short term, right? Chronic hypertension, baroreceptors, are they tonic or are they phasic? They take a long time to adapt. They're tonic. The problem is that they're tonic and they take a while to adapt, but once they adapt, they think this is normal. So let's say somebody has chronic high blood pressure for six months, and now their body's getting used to that, you know, 150 over 90 blood pressure. And you said, now you give them something to take down, like you give them an antidiuretic. That's the first thing they give for high blood pressure, right? An antidiuretic so that they pee out more urine. What's it doing to their blood volume? 
bring it down. What's it doing to the blood pressure? Brings it down to 120 over 80, right? Yeah. What does this baroreceptor think now that's adapted? That's too low. It sends a signal to the cardiovascular control center and says what? It Turn it back up. So it doesn't matter that they took the diuretic. It might have a, a really short-term effect, but what's going to happen to their blood pressure again? Oh, it rebounds. It goes right back up. So the moral of this, huh? So the more. Yep, so the moral of the story is don't do it in the first place. So, yeah, don't wait until your blood pressure is too high to start exercising and taking care of yourself. Get on a treadmill now. It'll help bring it back down, yeah. So you can do a lot of things to help correct this. Like, when they take meds to correct this, there's so many side effects because they're trying to target this, but they're also trying to dumb the brain. They're trying to screw with the kidneys and everything at the same time. There's so many bad things that happen. To try and just, yeah, to try and bring it down. And it, yeah. Well, when, what they're trying to do is they're trying to dumb the brain so that it doesn't go back up. Yeah. And then hypotension. What's severe life-threatening hypotension called? Shock. Yep. Hypotension is just low blood pressure, which a lot of performance athletes actually have a lower blood pressure. But that's okay because they're by so efficient at getting oxygen and nutrients that they can have a lower pressure. Yep. So their heart can be lower, which is going to reduce the pressure. Yep. But they're still fine. And then shock, when you look at this, it's because it's so low, it's life-threatening. And there are four types you need to know. They tell you what they are. Hypovolemic, what's happening? Low volume. What could have happened to them? There's bleeding out. So you, this is actually, if you take hemorrhagic shock, that's a type of hypovolemic. They hemorrhaged, right? They don't have enough blood, so they go into shock. What else could they have done? Not, ha not brought in enough fluids, right, so not enough water, and then their body's getting dehydrated, and they start going into this hypovolemic shock. Or they could have been doing what excessively that made them get rid of too much water? Sweating. Sweating. Yep, so all those are examples of a hypovolemic shock. You're losing blood volume. One way or another, you're losing blood volume. Number two, cardiogenic, guess what's causing it? Heart generated is what cardiogenic means. Heart generated. It's the heart. What's the heart not doing, obviously, if your blood pressure so low, huh? It's not pumping hard enough. It's not contracting hard enough. Number three, vasogenic. Guess what's wrong? It's the vessels. Yep, so there's something wrong with the vessels. Either the vessels are making too much, what, chemical that would cause massive dilation. Histamine or, so that would be like the immune system releasing too much histamine. Or what could the blood vessels be releasing? Nitric oxide, too much nit nitric oxide. Yep. So those are just a couple examples of what would cause vasogenic. How about neurogenic? What's causing it? Specifically, not just spe the brain, but specifically what system? What autonomic nervous system? The sympathetic, right? What's not happening with the sympathetic? Or, dang it, I just gave it away, didn't I? What's going on with the sympathetic? It's not firing. Yep. So when you aren't feeling really good and you, you've got this like head cold and your brain just out of it and you cloudy thinking it's it's affecting your neurons and then you stand up quickly when you're sitting down and you feel lightheaded why because your sympathetic didn't kick in and what happened the blood's going to your feet but your sympathetic's not squeezing those blood vessels to push it back up what's that shock called or shock what's that phase called orthostatic hypotension right so if that were so severe that would actually cause a neurogenic shock but neurogenic shock revolves around what system sympathetic nervous system. It's not working. It's just not turning on. So here are lots of examples. So hypovolemic shock, you can see a hemorrhage, vomiting. Why would vomiting cause hypovolemic? Losing fluids, dehydrated. Yep, diarrhea, why would that cause it? Exact same thing. Yep, so if you're losing fluids or if you're losing blood overall, both hypovolemic. Cardiogenic, weak heart. When you're looking at vasogenic, we talked about anaphylactic. It's too much what chemical? Histamine, yep. And it can be other other things in your body like bacteria. When bacteria stimulates the walls of the blood vessels, it causes them to respond too. Or it could be what two chemical or what chemical that we talked about that's made by the vas vessel wall. Endothelium contracts. It's nitric oxide, yep, which causes dilation. And then the last one, neurogenic, is all about sympathetic. So if you were asked a question like this, what type of shock is results in widespread vasodilation because of a vasodilatory substance. Vasogenic. Vasogenic, yep. It's because of the actual vessel. Right. And the consequences and compensations of shock. The consequences can be obviously...
death, yeah. So life-threatening, could overall outcome could be death. What's going to happen to your organs, though? Even if you don't die, what could be happening to your organs? Yeah, you could have multi-organ failure, right? So you could have the organs starting to shut down. The organs that are depending on the blood supply are the most blood supply at one heartbeat are the ones that are going to start shutting down first. What were the first two I told you demanded 20% of the blood circulation? <coughs> Brain and well, kidney. kidney, right? So they're very sensitive to changes. They need the blood. The skeleton can handle a little bit, or skeletal muscle can handle a little bit longer because they have that stored up oxygen, some stored up sugar and stuff. The brain doesn't, and the kidney's not doing that either. They need constant supply. So some of the first organs, that when somebody's going to shock, what are the first two organs you want to worry about failing? Brain and the kidney. So there's some of your consequences. Compensation, if it's vasogenic shock, what could the brain do? It could crank up what? The sympathetic, yeah. So it's going to start releasing lots of adrenaline to try and compensate. What could you do if they came into the hospital? You could stab them with epinephrine, right? So it would help bring it back up. Compensation, what's the kidney going to do to try and compensate for shock? Obviously, it's not getting flow anyway, but what else is it going to do? It's going to make sure you're not making lots of urine because what's it trying to do for you? It's trying to make you maintain water to increase blood volume. What's your hypothalamus going to tell you to start doing? 4S, right? What was one of those 4Fs that's going to make you, it's going to make you do? Make you start feeding more. What kind of feeding? Watery intake, yeah. So there you see, here's some compensations. And if you like pathways, here's the pathway out of your textbook too. So if you have a hemorrhage, kidney's going to try and produce less and less and less urine. Okay, so hemorrhage... If you have hemorrhage, you drop your blood volume, so you're going to start getting thirsty, which is what structure? Hypothalamus, yep. It's going to, your hypothalamus is also going to release a chemical called vasopressin, which is going to try and do what to your blood vessel walls? Constrict them. What was the other name? Anybody remember? I said it was a three-letter word, too. A-D-H. Antidiuretic hormone. It's like a combination. I'll throw the first letter right, you throw the rest of them, right? So it's also called antidiuretic, which is telling you it's doing what? Making you urinate less. So you're drinking more water and you're losing more, or losing less. So this is the hypothalamus doing this. It's trying to make you retain blood volume, which you follow this all the way around. Plasma volume goes up. Okay. So if you look, the blood volume as it drops, the venous return is also dropping, the stroke volume is dropping, the cardiac output is dropping, arterial pressure is dropping. You're moving into shock. So the baroreceptors fire faster. What's the brain going to say? Baroreceptors are firing, s s sorry, I said faster. Fire slower. What's the brain going to tell you to do? Crank up the sympathetic, which says what to your heart rate? What to do to your contractility? Raises it. What's to do to the blood vessels? Squeeze them, right? What's that going to do to your blood pressure? Raise it, trying to compensate for the shock. So you can see all these different pathways. We've already talked about all the pathways, but this is just an example. And an irreversible shock means that you're circling the drain. Right. We talked about blood in lab, so we're, we're not going to talk about it again. You have to know the different components. You have to know where they're important at. You have to know what their major, major purpose is. So that when you take a blood sample, there's a reason why they look at blood samples usually right away when somebody's not feeling well. If somebody has, and I know that well, probably only the lab people are going to know this, but if somebody has a really high level of asonophils, what are you going to expect? Probably a parasite, but what if they have high asonophils and high basophils? And allergy. If somebody has high neutrophils, what's happening? Yep, so it's right at the beginning of the infection. Um, if somebody has, I'm trying to think of a, another good example, reticulocytes, I use that word. If somebody has really high reticulocytes, what are those? They're premature red blood cells, which means they probably are destroying lots of red blood cells somewhere or losing lots of red blood cells. So if they have high reticulocytes, you have to worry about what? Some kind of internal damage or internal bleeding, exactly, internal hemorrhage. All right, so go through and look at those. Definitely know what erythropoietin is. Where's erythropoietin made, lab people? Yeah, I don't know why I'm flipping through this because uh, we already went through it in the lab. Sure. Oh, yeah, this one? So this is the slide that you want to look at when we go into lab. I'll come back to this because these are, here's the pathway for clotting. 
There are actually 12 different factors. They call them 1 through 13. Don't ask. It's too long of a story. But anyway, there are 12 factors that are involved here. One of them is actually just calcium. They give a factor name. But they're like dominoes. To get an actual clot, you have to knock this one over, that one over, that one over, that one over, and finally you get the outcome. What happens if you remove any of these? No clot. No clot. So the most important key players are actually going to be right here in this loop that I wanted you to pay attention to. So actually there's calcium, but the key players are going to be right here. So as I stimulate the platelets, the platelets release something called platelet factor 3. The platelet factor 3 triggers the, the activity of this chemical that's always floating through your blood. It's always floating. It's called prothrombin. When you see pro at the beginning, it means it's not active. But now it's active. This thrombin, it's going to cause the platelets to start sticking first. Platelets start bulging up. They start binding to wherever the break is. Thrombin's going to come around and make more thrombin. So it's going to activate prothrombin to become more thrombin. This thrombin's going to go down to fibrinogen. Is fibrinogen active? Nope, because it has a what on it? The O-gen, right? So it activates fibrinogen. Fibrin is like a fishnet. So fibrin causes this meshy network that's like fishnet to catch things like white blood cells, red blood cells, more platelets. It's clumping things together. It's sticking them together. And I think I may have, there it is. So there's fibrin. It's like fish webbing. So it's catching all the red blood cells. You're getting a bigger and bigger pile of these blood cells. In the meantime, thrombin's acting, activating more thrombin. Another thrombin comes over and it stimulates this stuff called factor 13, which is called fibrin stabilizing factor. What do you think it's going to do? It stabilizes the fibrin to make that clot even harder and more firm. In the meantime, thrombin's activating more thrombin. What is thrombin doing? What kind of loop is it stuck in? It's a positive feedback loop. It's making a bigger, stronger, more potentially dangerous clot, right? Thrombin's kind of the key player, and that's why this section is so important. What do you have to do? You're going to have to try and find some way to trim off that clot and stop thrombin. So there's one more chemical that you need to know that's not on the slide, and it's called plasmin ogen. What do you know about it? Bing, bing. So I'm going to come right there. So this plasmin ogen is not active. What do you have to do? You activate it. So some other chemicals in this pathway, when the clot starts getting bigger, you're going to start activating the plasminogen. But it's almost like sandpaper. It comes cruising along the clot and it starts sanding off the top so that the clot doesn't get overwhelming. And eventually, when this section's healed, that sandpaper keeps working until what has happened? It's smoothed the clot down to nothing. Do you want to just break that big clot off like a scab and send it through your system? because it'll clog things up. Remember your mom said don't pick scabs? So your mom's thinking like the inside of your body. You don't want to pick that thing off. You just wait for it to smooth over eventually. Right? And then that fresh tissue is underneath healing. So the key players you want to know are thrombin, which is that positive feedback thing. You want to know fibrin because it does what? It makes that fishnet to hold the clot together. What stabilizes fibrin? Factor 13, which is fibrin stabilizing factor. And then you've got this big bulky clot. What's going to trim it and keep it under control? It's plasmin, right? So plasmin smooths it over. Those are the only important parts you want to know with this pathway. It's just this section right here. Nope. I could, I could care less. You do need to know that thrombin activates fibrin. Thrombin activates fib, fib, uh, uh, factor 13. You need to know that thrombin causes the platelets co to coagulate. And there you go. So there's which chemical are you focusing on now? Thrombin. So thrombin activates all these other things. What else does thrombin activate that I didn't just mention? Prothrombin, right? It activates prothrombin and turns into more thrombin. So you've got that whole loop. Uh, the two enzymes, carbonic anhydrase. We're actually going to talk about that again when we get to the um, lungs. So we'll talk about it again. Carbonic anhydrase helps you convert carbon dioxide into a transportable form. And the other one was the glycolytic enzyme, right? Why do you need a glycolytic enzyme to make? What's the process it's trying to use? Glycolytic enzyme. Glycolysis. Why does a red blood cell need a glycolytic enzyme? Because it doesn't have a mitochondria, right? There's no mitochondria. It still needs to make ATP, but it's going to use a glycolysis instead. Fibrinogen is the inactive version.